What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world? I would like to welcome you back to the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. On today's episode, we've got on another amazing guest. This is Coach Bill Courtney. He is an American football coach, and he is also the CEO of Classic American Hardwoods. He's got a really interesting story. Um, I discovered him recently, and so we're about to have an awesome conversation. Welcome to the show, Bill. How are you doing? I'm groovy, Zuby. Which I've been dying to say. I think hey. that's fun. Hey, <laughs> you don't get to use B's and Z's that often. So yeah. it's good to talk to you, Zuby. Thanks for having <laughs> me, man. Thank you. I, I do. I, there's a lot of Z, a lot of Z's in my family. So uh, <laughs> yeah, and and my own name. So, so Bill, I've done a very brief intro there, but for people who aren't familiar with you, uh, please tell them a little bit about yourself and who you are and what brings you here today. Well, um, I, I'm. Pretty normal guy. Uh, grew up in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, dad left home when I was four. Mom was married and divorced five times. Um, fourth daddy shot at me down a hallway one night. Uh, dove out a window to save my life. Um, went to, uh, never lived in apartments my whole life. Um, went to school at Ole Miss, the University of Mississippi. Uh, much like you, I was schooled at Oxford. It's just Oxford, Mississippi. Um, and I um, I graduated at, with a degree in psychology and English. I wanted to be a developmental psychologist. Didn't have the money. So while I was working on my psychology doctorate, I was teaching school and coaching football. And as you can see, I'm kind of a mutt-headed guy. And i Somehow, a my wife, she's a dime. She's absolutely beautiful. Married me, and in the South, um, you know, I, I I wanted to make sure I kept around the house, so we just started having kids. So we had four kids in four years, and four kids and a wife wasn't getting it on seventeen thousand dollars a year. So I had to abandon my idea of finishing on my doctorate and got into the private world. Started a business in 2001 called Classic American Hardwoods, and that's now my business. We have, we do business in 42 different countries. I have an office in Shanghai, an office in Ho Chi Minh City, manufacturing city uh, facility here in Memphis. But because of the way I grew up, the men in my life that mattered the most were my coaches. They were where I got my, despite all of the insecurity and all of the issues that come along with fatherlessness, especially in my situation, um, the, 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 the men who mattered most to me in the world were my coaches. And so even when I left coaching as a profession, uh, it was still a passion. And in my state, you can be what's called a non-faculty certified football coach. If you take a bunch of classes and all and the state will certify you and you can work even as not a teacher, as a coach, so I continued to coach, and when I started my business, the opportunity came to coach at an inner city school not far from at a mile from my company, and um, I started coaching there, and seven years later, some goofy guys with straight-legged jeans wearing scarves, which nobody does in Memphis, showed up, and they said they wanted to make a movie, and um, never thought that would happen, but they did, and we thought we might see this thing on channel 422 one Wednesday and a year and a half later, I'm walking down the red carpet at the Academy Awards. We won an Academy Award, which led to speeches, which led to my book, which led to more speeches. And then which led to the launch about two months ago of my podcast an army of normal folks. So I'm a first, I'm a husband and a father. I'm a Memphian. I'm a, a football coach and a guy who owns a lumber company that somehow somebody came along and told his story and uh, it gave me a platform these last 10 years. And, um, you know, I, I'm trying to use that platform to, I think it's time we start having real conversations about the stuff that matters like race and creed and faith and politics, but we just do it in a non-threatening civil way. Uh, to try to break down some of this division that's happening in our country and in a lot of places in the world. 
And um, so I've used that platform to try to have those conversations. And uh, now the podcast to further that conversation and to also uh, hopefully inspire and reach uh, the hearts and minds of people across the, the globe that want to do something for humanity. That's powerful, man. And that's the exact message I got from watching the movie that you referred to, Undefeated, and just learning more about your story. I mean, you've expanded a bit more on your childhood and your background there. And in the movie, the thing that I think is, you know, there's a lot of things that are quite quite striking about it um, from the beginning and throughout. I think, you know, from from the very beginning is actually looking at certain parts of the city itself and thinking, gosh, this does not look like the wealthiest country <laughs> in the world. I mean, I, I'm from the UK. I spend a lot of time in the States and I've traveled to, I think, 20 different states and many different cities at this point. And it is bizarre to me how there are things and places you see in the USA, which look like, I don't even want to say third world. They look like fourth world. It looks so underdeveloped, so much misery and human despair and the lack of any type of investment, not just financial, but emotional, familial, all of that. So just sort of seeing some of those images, I think it was North, North Memphis. Am I right in the, in the movie? Yeah, it's uh, it. When you, I don't want people to think that North Memphis is another city. It's it's yeah. like Memphis, and then Memphis is bordered on the west by the Mississippi River, and then people talk in terms of North Memphis, downtown, East Memphis, and South Memphis, and Midtown, and so those are the five areas that kind of. And North Memphis is where Manassas is. And my business is here because I don't have any family money. I told you I grew up. Mm -hmm. I started my business $17,000. I needed cheap industrial property. And the cheapest industrial property in the United States was in North Memphis. Mm -hmm. That's how I ended up near Manassas. Um, but to your point, the, you know, the demographics of North Memphis are Fewer than 1% of the people that live in North Memphis have a college degree. Um, the unemployment rate is roughly 30%. Uh, I think something like 73% of the households named the grandmother as the head of the household. Mm -hmm. um, uh, fewer than 40% of the people have an operating vehicle. Um, and Memphis is not like New York where you have this vast public transit available in, in places like Memphis, medium sized cities like Memphis and Oklahoma city and Birmingham and Louisville, and even Nashville, you need a car to get around, especially have a job and get your kids to school and get to the grocery store. So fewer than four, you know, four out of 10 have a car. So you can imagine what, what kind of difficulties that puts on people from that neighborhood and the children that grow up in it. But maybe the most stark one is an 18 year old male in North Memphis is three times more likely to be dead or incarcerated by his 21st birthday than is to have a job. That's so insane. I, I, it, can you, can it, you repeat, can you repeat that again? Repeat that one more time. Yeah, sure. An 18 year old male is three times more likely to be dead or incarcerated by his 21st birthday than he is to have a job. Now that does not mean that three out of every four people end up in jail or dead. It's just three, you're three times more likely to be dead or in jail than you are to have a job. But remember, unemployment rate is around 30%. Yeah. So you're either dead, you're either in jail, or you're on the porch with no job. And that represents 75% of the community. And it's generational, abject poverty and loss. And that's what I showed up to when I showed up from NASA to coach football. Yeah. You know, a, a team that had won four games in 10 years and had 17 players on the team, torn up equipment, nothing, abject poverty, abject loss. And that's one of the poorest five zip codes in the United States. But you can see that in East St. Louis. You can see it in West mm -hmm. Chicago. You can see it in Baltimore. You can see it in parts of New York. You can see it in D.C. You can see it in L.A. You can see it in every, every city in this country. Yes. And you're right to think that our country – as people, and it is fourth world stuff, bro. It, it is. It is. It is terrible. And, and I, so I, I, I say fourth world because the level of despair and 
violence and drug addiction and things like that is actually much higher than it is in, say, a poor village in a third world country. It's it's actually worse. Like I said, I do business in 42 different countries. I've been to South Africa all, and, you know, I'm in the I'm in a manufacturing business, so I don't go hang out in the pretty places. I'm mm-hmm. where the manufacturing plants are. I've been all over North Africa. I've been all over Eastern Europe. I've been, you know, all over some of the poor uh, Central American countries where we do business. And there is no difference in places like West Side Chicago and East St. Louis and North Memphis than what you see in those places. And to think that that actually is occurring in our country is flabbergasting. And I will tell you something else. You heard how it came up. We didn't have a pot to pee in or a window to throw it out of. I didn't have any money. I didn't have, you know, and, and so I, I, I worked hard. I, I messed around. I did a lot of things I shouldn't have done as a kid. And I, I held all the insecurities and all the issues that come along with fatherlessness, but I did make it to college. I did find a way to, to work hard and make good enough grades and pull myself up by my brief steps and made a success for myself. And in our country with all of the freedoms we have, and a free education system, my attitude was, if you're in poverty and you're in situations like that, it's on you because we have this free education system and there's all these freedoms and abilities. And if I can do it, anybody can do it. And I will tell you something, that is the way I believe. Um, my seven years at Manassas changed that perspective significantly mm-hmm. because um, there are generational and systematic barriers that even as desperate as my childhood was, I didn't have to overcome. Mm -hmm. And until we start getting out of our preconceived notions based on who we are, how we believe, how we vote, how we worship and how we think and dive into some of these areas with an open mind and have open civil real conversations and listen to the people from these areas, we're never going to fix them. Government's not going to do it. And, and, You've got to get there to understand there. Yeah. And um, and my perspective on a lot of the world changed as a result of those seven years I spent there. Our podcast today is sponsored by The Wellness Company. As you guys know, I'm always looking for the best health and wellness products to give me an edge. But if I eliminate businesses that have gone woke or forced vax mandates on their employees, there are fewer and fewer companies that I feel comfortable supporting. That's where The Wellness Company comes in. The Wellness Company was formed by a team of doctors who lost their jobs for speaking up about mandates and pushing back against lockdowns. They offer live telemedicine and a wide range of custom-formulated supplements to help keep you at your best. My favorite Wellness Company product is their Spike Support Formula. It's the only product I've seen that contains ingredients researched to block and dissolve COVID spike proteins in the bloodstream. Taking daily spike support can bring better mental clarity and increased energy levels. Whether you're vaxxed or unvaxxed, it doesn't discriminate, and neither does the wellness company. Get back to that pre-COVID feeling. Go to twc.health forward slash Zuby and use code Zuby, that's Z-U-B-Y, to save 15% at checkout. That's twc.health forward slash Zuby and use the code Zuby at checkout. Yeah, man, there's so, there's so much so much stuff I want to get into here. I mean, I was saying that, yeah, the first thing that struck me was what we just talked about, right? The level of uh, deprivation and and poverty and just, just neglect, perhaps on all fronts. That's the best word for it. And then the second thing was your part and your role, right? Just how obvious it was that you became a father figure to this big team of, I think, is that 100, 100%? Black boys, I think it was in Se- in years? seven years. There was okay. one white student okay. and one Hispanic student, not players. Yes, student in the whole in school. the whole school. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah, there we so, go. And to be I, to be honest, I, that's I, also yeah. that's another thing that's quite mind blowing to me because I'm from the UK, and there, yeah, there are some places which are more like you know heavily a certain racial demographic or another, but I don't think there's any school that's like. 100 you know like uh, the racial demographics are different in the different countries but there's i don't 
as far as I'm aware, I've never come across a school that's like, you know, like 100%, you know, just, just black, that kind of thing. Like that well, doesn't really, this is. yeah, you might get somewhere that's like 70% or, yeah. or something like that in certain parts of London or whatever. But yeah, it was, you know, and it was just the really stepping into this role for these young men of being a father figure. There's a part in the movie where um, one of the former NFL players comes in and he asks the students a couple questions. And I think none of them are from a two parent household. Um, and I mean, that in itself is like, geez, like not, not one right in this whole room. Like that's, that's 70, pretty, pretty, 75 kids were in that room, 75 yeah. players. And, 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 and that, that's, that's crazy. But to me, there's just something like so powerful about the way you came in and just getting, getting a balance, getting the balance between tough love whilst also being genuine and obviously compassionate and caring about these people, but not in a, I think it's very actually hard, hard to strike that balance. I think you, you have the people who go like way, way too soft and it doesn't work because they just kind of get run over because they're not willing to put their foot down or tell people to shut up or, you know, kind of take that real leadership role. Or you kind of have the opposite, which is just, you know, full blown 100%, you know, no, no compassion doesn't really seem like there's true care there. And it's just, hyper aggressive and antagonistic and I, I feel I, as i was watching it i was like man this guy's really he's just struck the balance like this is this is like this is a dad figure right here two two things on that one and i thought you were gonna say it and maybe you were and then you held the word back but um especially in my case you got to be real careful that you don't come off as paternalistic mm. you bet you if a white savior saves nobody. Mm. And I want you to know, I didn't go there to be anybody's dad. And I didn't go there to save anybody. I went to coach football. Yeah, Kids are kids. I don't care. The zip code at the time of your birth should not determine the level of your success at 25 years old. But unfortunately, it does yes. in a lot of cases. And I didn't know that when I went there, all I knew is kids are kids. Kids in general want to be part of something exciting. They want to be part of something successful. They want to win. They want to be cared for, but they also want to be held accountable. Even when they fight you, they want to be held accountable. And I just went to coach football. Um, but what happened is I was struggling with my own demons, man. I mean, I had, I had four beautiful children and a wife and my, my, my wife looks at me when I'm 37 years old and says, do you realize every Christmas and Thanksgiving and father's day, you're a, a jerk. And I'm like, no, I'm not shut up. Why would you say that to me? And she's like, you are, you're miserable. And she, she said, I understand why. And I understand the father thing and everything is really hurtful to you, but you're going to have to determine when you want to quit being victimized by the way you grew up and start being a hero by, by what you have now, which is start celebrating being a father rather than not having one. And I tell that story because one of the reasons why I connected. So look, you see a white guy that owns an $80 million business driving around a nice car and a nice house with four kids and good schools and a pretty wife. You think you know who I am. You sum me up. You can see that. Conversely, you see a black kid tatted up from the sleeves up from the hood, walk around with a hoodie on and some dreads and maybe a grill. And you think you know what you're looking at there too. Well, that's part of our problem is we've gotten so compartmentalized and divided that we we can see someone in a, in a in about five seconds, we think we know what they are. But here's the truth. I identified with the kids at Manassas a lot more readily than I identified the reality of my own kids. Mm. My kids didn't grow up like me. Mm. Thank God they didn't, right? I'm not, I'm, it's great that they did. But the point is, one of the reasons I was able to, to connect with the kids at Manassas is Beneath all the bravado, I led her in six sports in high school. I was a dog too, you know, a long time ago. I'm just a fat old guy now, but I, I know what that is. And so, you know, I got the, you know, I know that, that it's a shield and this bravado you put on, but as a 15, 16, 17 year old kid, 
whose father never comes around, you start looking at yourself in the mirror and saying, man, what's wrong with me? What is it about me that my father doesn't want to be in my life? And what is it about me that I live in these circumstances? And you start to have lots of insecurities. You start to doubt yourself. And despite this thing you put on on the outside, the inside of you is torn up. And so I knew that's what was going on in a lot of the psyche of the kids at Manassas. And so what I did, I just started listening. And then we grew together. And as, and as they started to see me differently and I started to see them differently, amazing things started to happen. But that you first got to get out of your comfort zone. You got to have real conversations that matter and you got to serve one another. And so while I really appreciate and I'm humbled by what you're saying as far as being a father figure, um, the, the truth is those kids meant as much to my development as a human being as I did to theirs. That's awesome. And I think that's how it's, I think that's how it's supposed to be. I mean, that's something I'm not a parent yet, but that's something I hear a lot from parents in general and that I've observed with people I know who have kids, which is that the, you know, the learning process is, is two way. It's probably not exactly, it's probably not 50, 50 per se, but you know, it leads to the ad adults and parents learn from whether that's having their own kids, uh, teaching others, coaching, whatever it is. Like it's this, it's this two way process, which reveals your own strengths and weaknesses and insecurities and, you know, and young, young people are, there's a lot of smart young people out there, right? Not just academically smart, but the ideas and the questions and the, the way that they challenge and things like it's, it, it teaches you and you, and you develop through that. One of the smartest people I ever met was a 17 year old kid. My first year at Manassas. Mm -hmm. Now I bet he didn't make over a 15 on the ACT and he probably had below a 2.0 GPA, but he taught me one of my most top five valuable life lessons. Um, when we first got to Manassas, we started coaching football, right? But it was clear. We also st started needed to start coaching things like integrity, commitment, character, teamwork, values, right? And again, we inherited a team of 17 kids that won four games in 10 years. Their previous 10 years record was four wins and 95 losses. So they were terrible. And halfway through that first season, Zuby, we were three and three. Now I think three and three is pretty average, but when you won four games in 10 years, they thought I was like a I don't know, a fat redheaded version of Pete Carroll or somebody, <laughs> right? So we're three and three. So all the kids are yes or no, sir, on the football field, respectful, buying in and doing all that. But only half the team was buying in the important stuff, the character, the commitment, doing your homework, pulling your pants up, no sagging, you know, hold the door for the teachers or a young lady, be respectful. The other half the team, while buying in the football stuff, was back in the streets the minute practices and games were over. It was driving me crazy. So I went to my guy. The guy I'm telling you is one of the smartest people I've ever met. And I said, hey, man, what do I got to do to get that half the team to buy into the important stuff like you're half the team? And this guy and I had a lot of real talks. But this time he just kind of dismissively said, I'll keep doing what you're doing, coach. If you do have kids one day, you'll know the dismissive tone that kids give you. And I said, no, man, real talk. He said, coach, man, I don't want to hurt your feelings. And I said, bro, you're not going to hurt my feelings. Why can't I get that half the team to buy into the important stuff like your half team? He said, all right, real talk. I said, yeah, straight talk. He said, all right, coach, they're trying to figure out if you're a turkey person or not. Yeah, Zuby, I did that. I did that <laughs> because I will tell you, man, the first nine, 10 weeks I was at Manassas, I learned a lot of vernacular, a lot of phrases that I'd never used in my life before, but I'd never heard that one. And I, like, bro, what are you talking about? And he's like, coach, every Christmas and Thanksgiving, people roll into our neighborhoods and they give us, they give us gifts and hams and turkeys and we take them because we ain't got none. But they leave and we never see them again. Makes you wonder if they're doing that because they care about us or they're doing that to make themselves feel good. And look me dead in the eyes, Zuby. He said, Coach, what the hell are you doing here, man? Now I swore on your podcast, but that was what he said. Oh, that, that's okay. That's 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 and I and 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 and, and I'm gonna be honest with you, bro. That really made me mad. Bought new uniforms, ACT prep classes, pregame meals. Weren't riding up and down the road to games on cheese, had them in charter buses, 
which was leveling the playing field and trying to give these guys everything they need to be successful. And then they're going to look at me and say, you're a turkey person. And it, it made me angry until I started listening to myself. Because anytime anybody asked me something about Manassas, I was telling them, yeah, man, I got them taking ACT prep classes. I got them thinking about college. I got them winning games. I got them. Meanwhile, these kids from the hood who have nothing are getting called sellouts by some of their friends. Man, that white coach ain't got nothing to do with you. Mm-hmm. Man, you doing homework? Homework's for chumps, man. You oh, ain't man. making it out of the yeah. hood. They're getting, they're changing their whole ethos to be part of one positive thing. And the entire time anybody asks me anything about Manassas, I'm all too happy to tell them everything I'm doing because I'll tell you, it's true. I felt good about the people in my culture pat me on the back and tell me what a great guy I was. Yeah. And what I found out is this. If you serve in soup kitchens at Christmas or give away turkeys at Thanksgiving, it's a beautiful thing, man. That's not a bad thing. It's not what the story's about. It's what's your motive. Are you doing it? For the simple edification of people that are not as fortunate as you, are you are you leading by serving first, and are you giving credit to the people you're serving for the amazing strides they're making, or are you taking the limelight? Because if you are, you're motivated by the wrong things, and they may say yes sir, no sir, yes ma'am, no man to you, but the minute you turn and walk away, they stare darts through you because you're a fraud, you're a turkey person, and it was when I recognized how unbelievable that term and that story was. And I stopped talking about me and started talking about these kids that we went from three and three in an average team to the team you saw in the movie. And you're right. Kids are brilliant. If you're willing to shut up and listen to what they're saying and, and heed their warnings and advice. And one of the smartest kids I've ever met in the world taught me that. And, and I used that, principle in my business. I use it in society. I use it coaching and I use it with my own children and it has served me very well. Don't be a turkey person because a turkey person's a fraud. Awesome. I think I'm going to uh, add turkey person to my vernacular now. I've, n- I've never heard that term before. So uh, make, a, so make a rap about it, bro. <laughs> make a song about turkey people. That, yeah. That'll confuse people even more. Uh, well, but that's the thing, right? They got to, well, they got to find, they got to go deep to figure out what that's, what that's all about. What, what was the name of that young, that young man? Bobo. Bobo. Okay. Bobo. And how I, I want, I did want to ask, cause the, the movie, the documentary, it came out in 2011. Is that right? That's right. It won the 2012 Academy Award. And, okay. but the season was 2009. Okay. Got it. I was so, there seven years, so that was the seventh season. That season was 2009, but they left Memphis with 550 hours of film. I mean, they edited for well over a year to make the movie. That again, we literally, let's be real, man, especially in the documentary series, a full-length documentary, most things that win the Academy Award have some social impact statement to make. You know, those are the kind of things that get awards. Not, not a movie about a high school football team in the deep South, which a bunch of black players and a white coach that doesn't typically reach the hearts and minds of the folks in Hollywood and New York. Do you, do you know what I think though, is I I think it's so real that that's the feeling I got. Like I've, I've watched a lot of movies. I've watched a lot of documentaries stuff. You know, it can feel, it can feel contrived, right? Especially, especially that type of story. I think it can, it can be done in a very contrived way, especially if it's one of those, you know, based on a true story kind of thing. And then it's mm-hmm. it's heavily dramatized and it does have that sort of white savior sort of mm-hmm. vibe to it. It's not it's not raw and real. And you're just seeing it, it, it. It's real. Right. It's just a documentation of something that if you just told somebody the story, it sounds a little bit fantastical. It sounds kind of like. It doesn't sound real, right? It's, it it sounds like really. So there's this team who like they they never win over the course of like years and decades, and then you know this coach comes in and you know he gets on well with the kids, and all of a sudden like they're doing better in school, and now they're winning all their games and stuff. Like it it doesn't sound real, but then you watch it and it's like, man, this is this is just real, and you you see the process, you see the ups and the downs, you see the players 
fighting each other. You see the different personality types and, and you can see the pain. You can see the struggle. You can see you getting frustrated and you getting angry, right? It's not like you're there like this sort of angelic figure who no, is, you know? I, 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 I am no Ted Lasso, bro. <laughs> and, and, and I'll tell you something. I want you to know this because that's what you said. It is authentic. And in today's reality and docu-series genre of entertainment, since undefeated, I've been involved in some TV shows and stuff. And I'm going to tell you straight up, that is heavily scripted. Yes, I know. There was not a single time, not one in the entire filming of undefeated that I was asked to say something, repeat something, stand somewhere or any scene set. It is in the truest sense of the world word, a fly on the wall documentary. And it is a testament to TJ Martin and Dan Lindsay, the directors that they were so present 550 hours of film, bro. I mean, that is a lot of just filming. And so for all of the amazing scenes you see in undefeated, there's 40 hours of really mundane stuff that those dudes had to sit there and go through to get mm. to that and put it together. And it's almost, it's almost a month of footage. It's it, think of that. It's, yeah. in, it's insane. And now they've gone on to do LA 92 that won an Emmy the Tina documentary that was just on before she died. That was theirs. That was on HBO. That was amazing. You know, it turns out these guys who really hadn't done much before undefeated are incredibly talented and did a beautiful job of putting that story together. Um, but the whole point is there was nothing contrived about our story. It was very, very real. And I do think they do a great job of illustrating that to the person watching, which is to your point, I think why it, it did so well and continues to do well. Bill, how are those students doing now? These young men will be, this is over a decade ago now. Well, how, how are they doing? Try Do remember the movie is one year and focuses on three specific players. So that's three out of seven years of players, call it 50, three out of 350 players. And bro, there is a story under every helmet. So how are those kids doing? The three kids highlighted? Um, I'll tell you quickly, but there's a bunch of other stories that, you know, a movie can't capture in an hour and a half um, or an hour and 45 minutes. But, you know, I have kids that I've coached that are in jail. There's seven that are no longer on this earth. There are others that are um, professionals and doing beautifully because it's the real world, man. I mean, that's, and when you're coming from a place like new Chicago and Manassas, you get real world issues. Um, OC is uh, holding two jobs, working on being a fireman and he's a father to his five children and is doing beautifully uh, money is a good father to his daughter, Addison, and uh, is doing fine in Memphis. And Chavis is a good father to his four children and has probably, you know, the guy that was in jail for 15 months and starting fights and the biggest pain in the butt on the whole team is now started and, runtering, and running the North Memphis Steelers Youth and Mentoring Program and is mentoring about 170 boys and girls who on the back of the cheerleading uniforms and the jerseys is the word school first. And he holds his kids accountable to school and he has made a massive impact on the youth of North Memphis. Oh. Um, yeah. So I, I, mean, I love that because, hey, man, he's he's angry in that. Movie. <laughs> well, and I'll tell you, it, he was angry. Yeah. Th my podcast is only about 10 weeks old. But I think three weeks ago, he was my guest. And when you hear, if you watch Undefeated and watch that kid, and then hear the 28-year-old grown man and what Chavis is and doing, and most importantly, his unbelievable raw perspective on the reality of life now and what he's learned and the way he thinks, I mean, it's riveting how much that kid, he's not a kid, he's a young man now, but how much he's, He's changed. So in answer to your question, I keep up with them. A lot of them are doing great. A lot of them aren't. But that's life, man. That's the real world. Yeah, absolutely. What, what do you think is the most 
important. I mean, you, you, you touched on one of the most important life lessons that you got there. Um, but you know, first of all, are, are you still involved? Are you still involved in coaching directly or not anymore? When COVID started, it shut down high school football in Tennessee okay. and last season was the first full season back and I haven't gone back, but rest assured I will. I, it was 31 years that I coached while starting my business, everything else. And then the two COVID years off. And then last year, not this year because of the podcast, but I hope to get back next year. Okay. And how much has that area or region changed since 2009? Is it still? It's worse. It's worse, really? Yeah. I mean, it just, it's just another generation of downhill advancement. You, you were gonna. You were asking me life lessons beyond the turkey person story, and we don't have a ten-hour podcast to go through all my life lessons. But I want to say this to you: um, another part of my ethos that changed. I told you that my my thought process about the old good old American fashion hard work, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, and everything's going to go fine. I do believe in the American hard work ethic, and I do believe we have to pull ourselves up our bootstraps. I'm just here to tell you that's sometimes not all. Um, that's sometimes not enough for some for sure. because of, of the the barriers and obstacles they got. to Look, man, when you're running around, I had a guy named Arshay Cooper on my podcast from West Side Chicago who was on the first all-black rowing team in the United States. And I asked him, you know, Arshay, tell me why a kid from West Side Chicago can't learn in school. Because he said they can't learn in school. And he's like, Bill, when you hear gunshots every night, when you step over pools of blood going down the hallway of your project or your apartment building to get out, when the air reeks of, of crack smoke and weed, when all you hear are sirens, when all of that, is so common that it's no different than the clicking of a fan blade, an old fan in an old apartment. Every time it goes around, click, 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 click. After a while, you don't even hear the click. You just know there's a fan over there. After a while, you don't even hear all this. When you see all of that, the same stuff a soldier in Afghanistan or Iraq comes back from uh, a 12-month deployment and has PTSD, and you see all of that as a 13-year-old, you don't care who discovered America. You don't care what 50% of 50 is. Mm -hmm. You don't, you don't give it, you don't give two butts about the Pythagorean theorem. Those things no longer matter to you because you're just surviving, bro. And you're not only surviving the gunshots, you're just surviving trying to be a human being. You're just tr trying to survive being sane. And you can't learn in those circumstances. And that is just so true. It is an inconvenient truth that people that are, that are in the middle class and upper class that haven't seen this firsthand, they may hear it and they may cognitively get it, but they don't feel it, bro. They don't yeah. feel that. Yeah. And, and I guess what I'm saying to you is the life lesson is it dawned on me that we pass by these police places every day in our nice cars. It's, it's the places you don't want your car to break down, right? When you look over the viaduct and you see that abject loss and despair, you're just thinking, don't have a flat tire here. Or you look down the street to that neighborhood. We all have them in our cities. And then as we pass by, we do think to ourselves, man, somebody ought to do something about that down there one day, mm -hmm. right? Bro, who is somebody? The government has proven woefully inadequate. And yeah. I would argue if you want to get into this chat, paternalistic mm -hmm. and the fancy people on the national news media that, that herd us like sheep to different viewpoints in order to divide us, they're not fixing anything. I just think we need to till that rear view mirror about 15 degrees to the left instead of looking over as if the sentiment matters that somebody ought to, maybe we tilt that rear view mirror 15 degrees to the left and say, man, maybe I could do something about that one day. I think if we had hundreds of thousands of people, that attitude and a quote army 
of normal folks, not fancy people on TV, not politicians in DC, but just an army of normal folks saying, you know what? I've got some ability and I've got a passion. It may not be football. It may be music. It may be, it may be art. It, it may be, it, heck, it may be entrepreneurship classes. It may be something as simple as rudimentary financial skills, like why a bank and a checkbook matter and why cashing your check at a liquor store for 7% is giving away way too much of your money. It may be any of that stuff. But if we had an army of normal folk serving, we literally could change culture and the trajectory of what's going on. And I learned that from my time at Manassas. Yes. Man, there's there's so much stuff to... There, there's so many angles to to go in this one. I mean, I I think you're you're completely correct. It's a very multi layered, it's a very multi layered problem, and I can see it and understand and empathize with it from a lot of different angles, right? Um, and I think the the truth is that where 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 people are now as a society, and in terms of you know the politics and the way they view the government and so on is the idea that the government is this paternalistic thing. And I think that's also people are like, hey, I'm paying a lot of money in taxes. Like, where is this all going? Like, you should be sorting this out. You should be sorting out the homelessness. You should be, you know, fixing up some of these broken down areas and so on. So um, by intention or just as a result of what people have gotten used to, people have mentally outsourced the responsibility for that, right? I do think Bing, you know, bingo, right. brother. Yes. And right. and it follows then that you become a victim of that systematic paternalism. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's dangerous. And it, but here's the thing. Now there's a flip side to that, right? If if you grew up like I did, all right. Fortunately, my mom had a job and a car and we had grandparents that helped us. All right. But if we didn't have that, let's say I'm a kid from New Chicago, right? And I'm a woman and I've got two kids, no daddy around, no car to get to work. So I'm reliant on help. And, and here's the rule. If you don't make above this amount of money, you get this much help. But if you climb the ladder and make a little more than that, your help gets cut in half, yep. whether it's whether it's food or, or rent assistance or whatever. You are fearful of trying to advance yourself to lose the little bit that you do have that. And even though what little bit you do have barely sustains you and keeps you basically in poverty, it's at least enough to barely get by. Yep. But if you try to advance yourself and risk losing that and the effort to advance yourself, you lose what you got and then you can't advance yourself, then you're on the streets. What is more paternalistic than a system that does that to people? Yeah, it's um, it's a perverse incentive. And it's, man, it, it, it's such a weird one. And, you know, I, I have... I, I kind of have like strange views on this as well, because I mean, I, I'm not even an American, right? Let alone being from Tennessee, let alone being from Memphis or whatever, but just as, just as a human being, um, you know, I do care about fellow human beings and I do want to see people get better and I do want to see people thrive and move towards their potential. One of the, one of the very funny things with, with myself is I, I don't, I don't get this from anyone who actually, actually knows me and understands my positions, but because I'm not in the camp of, hey, everyone just like give tons of money to the government for everything, like give all your money to the government and they're going <laughs> to fix everything, right? Because I don't hold that position, right? In fact, I'm the one saying, hey, you know, taxation is theft, right? You know, like more, more charity, less taxation. And, you know, people, oh, you know, you don't care about poor people or you don't care about this or you don't care. I'm like, no, but as you said earlier, like the government has, number one, the government has quite literally created the policies over the course of decades that put people in certain situations and kept them there. Um, and then on top of that, over the course of however many decades, they've proven that either they genuinely don't care or they're just so incompetent 
that they can't make this better. Whether this is the San Francisco homeless and drug situation or LA, or this is what you're talking about in Memphis. I mean, we're talking about 14 years ago that this was made. And you're saying, okay, 14 years ago, it's like that. And now it's gotten even worse. Like Lord knows how many billions of dollars they've had, you know, in budget to make these things better. And they they won't do it like they're they're not doing it and so that's part of where my perspective it's, comes it, from of just like hey look this thing is not fit for this is not fit for purpose and i do think that if people were not giving so much money to that they wouldn't have the mindset that oh okay that's the government's job to deal with and oh you know what maybe we, maybe we just need to give them an extra five percent and then they'll do it. and and they the truth is that they they won't and it doesn't make me sort of happy to say that right i do wish hey all that money can go into this in theory it could but the truth is that it 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 just doesn't and I, um yeah, I, I would i would submit to you this is my exact point that it's going to take an army of normal folks not the government not yeah. fancy people an army of normal folks that say we have to help our common man. We have to care. It doesn't matter where you're from, what you look like, how you worship or how you vote. What it matters is our common humanity says that as somebody who has been gifted with many blessings, it's my responsibility to find places that I can help serve and, 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 army of normal folks could change that. No amount of government will ever mm -hmm. change that. The other thing I'll tell you is I believe with everything I am, the greatest success, the greatest measure of the success of a leader is the actions of the followers. The greatest measure of the success of a leader is the actions of followers. If you show me an organization where everybody working and it's doing what they're supposed to do, I'll show you good leadership. If you show me a team, a family, a business, any organization where all the people are running amok, I'll show you poor leadership. Because the greatest measure of the success of leaders, actions of followers. Mm. So let's talk about what kind of leadership our government has proven to be for the most needy followers among us. It just doesn't work. No. We can fix it. Government's not. And if we just get out of our comfort zones, put aside societal preconceived notions, quit having empty sentiments that somebody ought to do something, mm -hmm. and we as a as a as a as a people take it on, I genuinely believe we can fix it. Yeah, I totally agree. And, and I'd go, I'd also add another point to this of why I think that sort of approach is so important. I think one of the problems with having the government as the middleman, you know, beyond the incompetence and lack of real objective results, is also that it dissipates the the feeling of community and the and the back and forth, right? I think it's extremely important that all of the hundreds of students who you coached, it's extremely important that they know who you are and you know who they are right? If there's that middle, man, if it's just, hey, you just throw a um, uh, hundred thousand, a million dollars at this entity, and then it just goes, you know, people are like, oh, we got the money from the government. It's like, no, actually, you didn't get the money from the government. You got the money, right? You got the money from other faceless, unknown people somewhere in your city, state, or country. You, you can't thank them. Even if you wanted to thank them, you can't because there's this disconnect. They don't know who you are. You don't know who they are. So the sort of natural, mutual human caring is is lost, right? So I, I think that's another reason why that sort of approach isn't just more effective, but I think that I think it's extremely important that the people who are helped by something are able to know, hey, this is this is where that came from. Well, you know, thank you. Oh, thanks for helping me out, right? If someone helps me with something, I like to be able to know who it was and you know, you and, and you and you can pay it forward because it's like, you know what, this isn't just magic money that came from the state. This is like other people have invested in me, have invested in my community. And then I think naturally as a human being, you want to do that in the future. You were just telling me about the this this young man, is it Chavis? Right? I, I would I would wager that a lot of the work he's doing now is his 
sense of paying it forward. He's like, look, when I was in my teens, I had this person or these people help me out with this. Okay, cool. Now that I'm in, now that I'm an adult, I can, let me, let me do something. Let me do, let me, let me also do something for my community. And I think that is just the natural cycle of how human beings behave. And I don't think a lot of people really think of it that way when they're just like, Hey, just, you know, throw all your money at politics and then you can just, and then, you know, you, you've done your bit, um, even though you didn't probably wasn't voluntary, <laughs> but you know, you, you've done your bit and it's up to them to, to fix it. And if, if they don't fix it, just vote harder next time. Zuby, I think your comment about community and removing the middleman is really powerful because it's very true. I think there's even one more element to add to your point. And you're right about Chavis, by the way. He says he does what he did. He said two things. He said he does what he did because of what he learned from our coaching staff. And he works hard to coach the him out of his kids. Mm -hmm. With regard to your point about the community, <clears throat> is not only does that, does that community matter, but with the middleman, you also remove something that happens a lot, which is resentment. The, the people that are disadvantaged resent everybody with the money and the people with the money resent paying taxes to go the disadvantaged mm -hmm. because they don't understand each other. Yes. If you have a community and you start to understand each other, you also, not only do you grow those bonds you're talking about, you also remove a significant problem that I think exists all over the world oh, for sure. is, is class resentment. And it mm -hmm. goes both ways. Mm -hmm. And in the U S it's, you've got a racial layer on top of it as well. On top of it. It's <laughs> right? just on top even of horrible. It. Yeah. Um, why do you think, um, you, we, we've touched on this, uh, topic a little bit in here, but so, something I've noticed as well, when I, when I have these conversations with, with certain people is I find that, look, I'll, I'll, I think the, I think the biggest social problem in the United States of America, I say, this is a non-American. If I were to say what I think the single biggest social problem is, I believe it's fatherlessness. And I also think that on top of that, one of the biggest problems is people are afraid and unwilling to talk about it. Maybe because people sort of take it personally, right? So if, if a lot of people d didn't have fathers in their lives, they feel triggered by it, or if it's a, a single mother and it's people are thinking you're putting them down. No, I'm, no. But I think that if, if you look at so many of the downstream social issues at the sort of at the, at the root, that's the base of where so much of those things seem to come from. And it doesn't seem like there's a real conversation happening about that. If you look at all the other issues people are talking about and people are fighting and bickering and doing this and doing that, and I'm not seeing, I mean, I, I, I can't even think of a, a politician or a policymaker or even, even like a, there aren't very many even just well-known general public figures who are like, hey, this is, this is a big problem. Like this, this is an issue. And what are we going to do to address this like how, how are we are we even going to talk about this i could not agree with you more but um here 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 we go this is what i mean by having conversations about the stuff that matters that people run from that i will refuse to run from uh because it matters but i'm going to tell you zuby i agree with you completely but let's talk about the reality of of culture right now. Um, it is assumed that if a white guy in a city talks about fatherlessness, he's talking about black people. That's so assumed. Crazy. Well, that's it's crazy. true. Well, that's true. And then all of a sudden I'm a racist for talking about black kids in the hood that don't have fathers and how horrible of a situation that is and how that leads to generational poverty and all kinds of problems with young teenage kids not having that male role model in their life. It also, listen, one of my best mentors told me when I was in college, he said, when you become a father, understand the way you treat your wife is how your sons will treat their wife. Mm -hmm. And the way you treat your wife is how your daughters will expect to be treated. If you are rude and cheat 
and do all kinds of things to your wife, your daughters will just expect that. And if that's what you want for your daughters, treat your wife that way. And if you want your sons to be divorced, treat your wife like crap, because that's what they're going to do. Conversely, they're going to emulate and they're going to expect the positive thing. In so much of our country, we don't even have that illustration, that example. And we wonder why the nuclear family's breaking down. Mm-hmm. We, we do what we see our parents do. And if our parents get up and, and, and have breakfast at the table or dinner together at the table and go to work every day and interact with children, then that's with, oh, that's what we're supposed to do when we grew up. But if there's none of that, why would you expect that somebody all of a sudden is going to start having those kind of family centered values? So I absolutely agree that followlessness is a huge issue and maybe one of the the paramount issue, but who's going to talk about it? White people are afraid that they're going to be called racist if they talk about it. The truth is there's more white kids that without fathers than there are black kids in the country without fathers just by sheer numbers. Total numbers, yeah. Yeah, total numbers. But there's an assumption about that. And then... Do you know what I think? Sure. I I think people need to get over that. I I agree. I think think people need to care less about false accusations of isms and phobias, right? I think people need to speak the... like. The, the idea that, well, firstly, for someone to even jump to the idea that fatherlessness equals talking about black people, that's kind of racist in itself. <laughs> but, but even beyond that, if it someone- It absolutely gen- is. Yeah, but even but beyond that, if someone genuinely cares, not, not in the virtue signaling sense, but in, in it truly, truly cares about certain uh, demographics or inner city areas or whatever it is, then you have to be willing to talk about the core issues. If yeah. you're shot down every time you would, like, I, I think on an individual level, like I get no one, no one wants to be called a racist, right? No one wants to be called whatever, but I think people need to get better at like, hey, look, I'm bringing up this thing that I care about and which is a real issue for people I care about and I'm concerned about. And you know what, if, if you're gonna call me racist for that, like you, you, what, you know, you, you don't matter. Cause that's your problem. Yeah, yeah, because, because, the, these sort of false accusations and sort of hair trigger desire to call someone some type of bigot is causing the problems to persist. It's not even that it's a neutral thing. It's like, if you do that, you are preventing the conversation from happening, which would even diagnose the problem. And if you don't diagnose a problem, you're never going to get solutions. If you can't talk about, if you can't even talk about fatherless homes, if you can't even talk about that stuff. How on earth are you going to fix it? You'll you'll be misdiagnosing the problem. You'll be it it it's just it's just bonkers to me. Zuby, when you asked me to introduce your, myself, I told you at the end of that that this platform I'm using to have conversations about race and politics and faith and creed and the stuff that matters, but just do it in a non-threatening civil way. Because until we talk about that stuff. We, this division that's happening, racial division, political division, sexual division, all of it is killing us because we're, we're getting separated into all these compartments. And then if we even try to have a rational, mature, adult, civil, non-threatening, but real conversation about it, you're so afraid if, if in your ignorance, because you don't understand and you're trying to understand by having a conversation, but if you're in your ignorance, you might say the wrong thing or say, don't use the wrong phrase, not even knowing what it means, or God forbid, trigger somebody, they're immediately going to default to, well, you're a piece of crap. You're this, you're that. I knew you were like this and you're my enemy now. Yeah. And, and what happens is because we're, we're no longer able to have these conversations we divide more. We shrink more. We retreat more into those that look and think like us because it's the only safe place there is. Mm. And in the meantime, our culture continues to fall apart because we don't even understand each other. Yeah. We have to quit. We have to have these conversations. We yeah. have to. Absolutely. And again, those conversations are never, never going to be had in a civil, non-threatening way 
in the political discourse. Mm -hmm. They're never going to happen on CNN and Fox. Dude, that something can happen today. Newsmax, Fox, CNN, and MSNBC will all report on it, and you will think it was four completely different things. <laughs> all right? That's so true. they're not going to fix it. You There's know what's no going to fix it? Is guys normal like people. An army of normal folks. Yeah. You were, ask, you were asking you were asking before we even started recording why why I started my podcast and actually what we're talking about is a, ma a massive part of the reason and it's also why I called it real talk with Zuby it was like look I just want to talk to real people and have real conversations cuz something that's happened that's happened and is happening and I do think that this is I do think people are getting tired of this by the way and are starting to notice the tactic but you know I'm sure you're familiar with uh, in conversation the principle of charity, mm -hmm. right? Which is if there's a if there's a misunderstanding or someone says something that you don't quite get, you you try to interpret it in the best way possible. You you give it a charitable interpretation and ask them for clarity, right? You don't try to jump down their throat or get get a gotcha to call them some type of name. And I often say that now, so many of these conversations, especially in the political realm and in the mainstream media realm, they're literally operating off the principle of uncharity, right? <laughs> if you don't, that it, is so true. Like, like if you say something that even slightly, slightly I'm could be jumping on it right now. <laughs> just, you know boom. why? You just gave me a talking point. I'm going to hammer your butt over it, rather than exactly what you're saying. The, let me ask you something, Zuby. What is a white person supposed to refer to a person of color as in this country um, because are they african-american are they black are they a person of color and and the point is i spent seven years coaching black kids mm -hmm. i have asked that question before seriously asked that question and i have gotten four different answers yeah so there's no way i'm not going to insult somebody because nobody agrees on the same answer. And here's the deal. The principle of charity would say the dude's not a racist. He's searching for the right word. And if he uses a word that's a little different than the other, give the dude a break. He's just yeah. trying to have a conversation. But instead, what do you mean African-American? My, yeah. my, an <laughs> my ancestors are from Jamaica. <laughs> I'm not an African-American. Oh, well, okay, black, man... I I'm a, I'm yeah. a, I'm a person of color. And, and, and then you, you know, call somebody a person of color and they're like, I'm not Hispanic. Why are you referring to me as a person of color? How the hell do I talk to you then, bro? Yeah. Give me a break, please. And, Let's and just you know, chat. And, and do you know what happens beyond is it, it fully derails the conversation. Cause now, it does. now, now, you, now, now the headline and takeaway is about what is the right term to call, to yeah. call another, and a look, melanated I'm, person. I'm and not. not how, yeah, how do we fix the issue we were here. trying to discuss? I, I, I want to be careful with you, Zuby. I'm not trying to play the poor, pitiful white guy because <laughs> I don't know what to call a black person. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that you're so right about the principle of charity. And by the way, it's quite English, the principle of charity, which is... I'm an Englishman. I, I know that. <laughs> and, and it is very civil and very English, but let's not let's not hang on every single word. If the person's genuinely coming from a, 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 a place of, of decency to have a real conversation about the stuff that matters, let people slide a little bit and just listen to them and, and offer a different perspective in a charitable civil way. And maybe minds can come together. And that's what happened at Manassas. And that's what I'm trying to do on a national stage with an army of normal folks. And, and what you're talking about is absolutely real talk. Yeah, absolutely, man. And I, I love the fact that you've called it, you know, an army of normal folks, because I do think that is for so many things that is ultimately the solution. I think the people who want to operate off the principle of charity and actually trying to have conversations and try to solve problems who people who want to be the adults in the room i'm like let's be the adults in the room if other people want to play these little games and see who can most see who can call the other one racist first score the most like, points yeah score score the most points you know dunk dunk get the most dunks whatever you know like cool <laughs> let, let let them play that game and you know what because th this is what i've started to do actually because you know I, I operate in the public sphere i'm on social media i do public speaking or whatever and i i've just gotten to the point where 
look, I, I, you, you can quite easily tell when someone is operating in good faith, right? You so it, I, I will talk to anybody anywhere on the spectrum, whatever, agree, disagree. If you operate in good faith and you're not trying to get me and I'm not trying to get you, I will talk to anybody. I can break bread with anyone. I can find our common ground. I can, I, I, I can, to me, that's kind of my tribe, right? It's not even ideological. It's just like, look, can we have a conversation and we're not just trying to play some silly game here? Um, I, I, I think, I think that's the way I think. And I find if someone is not willing to do that, then these days I, I don't really try to convert them per se. I'm just like, you know what? This conversation's not, not worth having. If it's I also say, not, it's also not healthy. No, it's, it's, it's It'll not drive healthy. you insane. Yeah. If I say, you know, I like dogs and it's like, oh, so you hate cats. I'm just like, you know what, bro? Right. Like, yeah, if that's how you're going to roll, I'm going to step away from this conversation and go talk to an adult. And I think perhaps that's what we just kind of need to do as a society and just be like, look, y'all can keep playing these games. Let's go actually build some bridges. And if, if we'll quit listening to the partisan national media who leads us like, like sheep to our prospective political corners and quit buying into the narrative that if you don't vote, look, worship, or act like me, you're my enemy. If we will just shut out that narrative and as an army of normal folks, regardless of, of our different differences, serve one another and have conversations like we're having about the stuff that matters. That's what will fix it, Zuby. And and all the things you're saying are just, in my opinion, that I hate to come on your show and just be a yes man and just agree <laughs> with what you, but it, it, it truly is. The problem is we got to get more and more folks to be willing to step out there, ignore cancel culture, ignore all the, all the, all the, listen, Bro, how does a guy make an uh, would you sign on to any job that you make $175,000 on two-year contracts and after five of those two-year contracts you end up with $7 million in the bank? I'd do that. Uh, $175,000 okay. a year, two-year okay. contract, 10 years, you're worth 6-7 million. Okay, yeah. A United States congressman makes $175,000. Oh, gotcha. They work 2 years. They get elected, and after four or five rolls through Congress, they're millionaires. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. If you don't think that the narrative is corrupted by amazing wealth and power in places like D.C., in places like the London Parliament, the, the U.K. Parliament, in places like, like the powerful news media, if you don't think they're incented heavily by enormous wealth and power to continue to divide us and hook us and keep us in that corner so we keep feeding into them so they can feed into us, if you don't see that, you're missing what's happening in our country. And the only way we're going to break that is if as an army of normal folks, we come together, have real conversations, celebrate the good that each of us doing, find our common grounds and fix this thing. It's really the only thing it's going to take because we're concentrating too much power and wealth in too few hands. And like sheep, mm -hmm. we're just going to it and giving it to them. And I'm tired of it, man. We can yeah. do better. 100%, man. 100%. And I think the tide is turning in that regard. I, I am optimistic in that regard. Um, I, I, I see more and more people not just not just waking up, but doing something, right? Whether that's starting a podcast or a YouTube channel or posting about stuff on social media or sharing things and being willing to have those convos. I do, I am, I have seen a shift even in the last five years, say, I think five years ago, people were really, really scared of, you know, getting, getting canceled or, you know, st stepping on the wrong landmine or discussing the wrong issue or this or this. And I am increasingly finding people just being like, you know what? This has been going on for too many years. This is affecting me. This is affecting my kids. This is affecting like my community. Let's just let's just talk. Let's let's come back to a position of normalcy. And because because otherwise, if you descend in the opposite direction, the truth is it's not it's not sustainable. That it's is not. how you that is how you end up destroying your country. Right. Um, it's true. 
it, it, it's not it, 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 the whole thing will just dissolve and break apart and you know it might be violent and whatever and people people don't want that and you know as you said earlier most people are decent we both traveled around the world a lot you find that regardless of where people are from the country the the ethnicity the religion what most people are decent most people are decent or at least doing their best to be and so if everyone can kind of like look up and realize that and operate in that way, which by the way, I think in the real world, most people do, most people actually do. Um, then yeah, I think, uh, that's how, that's how you fix a lot of these issues. I think you're right. Most people are, and most people do. The problem is not the problem that the challenge I think is, is to have them not feel like they're on an Island and doing that. They need to have a community of yes. people. And that's, again, this kind of this concept of an army of normal folks, create a community of people who think just like you do. Maybe you vote left, maybe you vote right, mm -hmm. maybe you're Jewish, maybe you're Muslim, maybe you're Christian, maybe you're gay, maybe you're straight, maybe you're re Republican, Democrat, whatever. But if, if, if you can, if you can co have conversation in the margins and in general, like you say, just want to do the right thing and, and be a good, it, I do think there, there is a, there is a, an, a, an, a, an opportunity to build a community of people who can see past the, the tags mm -hmm. and celebrate one another's humanity. And, and, and you're, and, you know, I don't want to go too far and be one of these impending doom guys but I do think it's an existential threat for society if we don't fix it. I yes. genuinely do. Not tomorrow, but I wonder what the world's going to look like for my grandchildren if we don't get this right. Absolutely. We've got to celebrate each other's humanity. Yeah. Uh, look, the, 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 power, the, the power always lies with the people, ultimately. The power does lie with the normal folks. Yes, the media is influential. Yes, politicians are influential. Yes, you know, there's international organizations that you know are influential but ultimately it's always down to each individual human being to be like all right how am i going to act how am i going to behave and and honestly it's something that is a that is a challenge right i mean as someone who's built up you know a, a large a large following online you know with across the board almost almost 2 million followers now which is kind of crazy for me to even think about i do my best to i do my best to model this Right. Because I understand and I can see how people get in the temptation of the truth is it's a lot easier and perhaps at least short term more lucrative to just be the super partisan person who just just takes, you know what, I'm just going to go completely into this tribe. I'm going to spend all my time attacking the other tribe and kind of just saying the talking points I know my side wants to hear. It'll get me the views. It'll get me the boost in the algorithm. It'll get me the sponsorship deals. It'll get me the money, the TV appearances, whatever. And I'm just going to be straight up 100% in that camp or 100% in that one. And it's a, it's a, for me, for me, it's not particularly difficult, but I can see for a lot of people, it's very tempting to do that because it's rewarded, right? If I'm on Twitter, I'm, I'm potential, I can potentially be rewarded for like, you know, using the principle of uncharity, right? Someone I don't like, or <laughs> someone I disagree with says something and I can just take it and like, I can just dunk on them right there. Especially um, with or, two million followers, because you can yes. get, you can get people trending exactly. on the dunk. Exactly. But what have you done for society? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, and, and I know that people are people are watching. I have a lot of eyeballs on me every day. I have millions of eyeballs on me and it's like, okay, let me do my best to not just talk this talk. Let me do my best to model it. Look, here's how you can deal with someone who disagrees with you without being, you know, without being mean to them. Here's how you can handle this. Here's how you can do this. You know, I'm not, I'm not perfect with it. And there's not really like a, a blueprint for this weird social media world. No. Um, but, but I do my best to any conversation I'm in, any podcast I'm in, anytime I get a TV appearance or whatever, or just interacting in real life. Um, I want to like, just show people, Hey, look, you can, you can do this. I know, I know it's difficult. I know people are, trust me, I know more than Trust me, I know that people can be frustrating, especially online. Like I every day right now as we're recording this, there's someone there like, you know, trying to trying to get me or whatever. And um, it 
it's hard. It's hard. And it, it, it takes, it takes grace. It takes patience. It takes, uh, sometimes you have to kind of step away from it all and just be like, you know what, let me not even look at this right now. Um, but I think, you know, we're, we're getting better at it and I am seeing emerging, emerging leaders, shall I say, leaders and communicators who are doing this all and modeling it all much better than their sort of legacy predecessors, right? I am seeing a new, a new crop of people doing this and using the technology that we now have to have these type of conversations, put it out there to thousands of millions of people, and then people can tune in and learn from it. And even in those conversations, right, they might hear a clash of um, values or policies or ideas or whatever, and they can hear those two people navigate it whilst maintaining respect and civility and kindness. And at the end of it, being like, oh, wow, that was a great conversation. You know, it wasn't just two people screaming at each other and calling each other names, uh, which is what we what we've had for far too long and, and that's it and look man i mean you and i are cut from the same cloth you know <laughs> you're you're a black dude from england and i'm a white dude from memphis we yep. both went to oxford though uh -huh. um i just went to oxford mississippi but the point is i we are cut from the same cloth and we're taking a bite of the same apple just from different sides you know my my whole thing is to inspire people to listen to stories about normal folks doing amazing things, be entertaining, but hopefully, hopefully be a conduit to help more and more people find ways that they can employ their skills with their passion to fill a, a area need in their little corner of the world. And your bite of the apple is to, to have those conversations and tell those stories. But I, you know, I, I, it, it It is what we have to do is have these conversations and show people how to have them in a respectful, non-threatening way. And, and bro, you know, if we aren't successful at this, what's the alternative? Mm. Yeah, we have to be. Bill, man, I could talk to you for uh, many, many more hours. But, I could do um, so. I I say, <laughs> I'd like to go kick it with you over some food somewhere in New York I, I, or Miami. You're in Miami. I, I would love to be able to do that. Maybe uh, m maybe we'll cross paths where we can hang out and solve the world's problems together. Yeah, I, I sure, think it'd man. be a blast. No doubt, man. Awesome. Um, Bill, where can people find and follow you online? Um, the podcast is normalfolks.us. And listen, one, one thing I've learned, I've been on lots of press and everything the last, you know, five, six, seven weeks and continue to do it. But as much as I did during the Academy Awards even, but nothing is as important as people downloading it, subscribing it, and sharing it with their friends. That The word of mouth and sharing on social. So normalfolks.us, subscribe to it, download it, listen to a couple episodes. If you like it, share with friends. And if you want to find more about the movie, the book, all that, you can go to coachbillcourtney.com. And between those two things, you'll get all of the fat redheaded guy that you can possibly muster. Awesome. Bill, thanks so much for coming on the podcast, man. Really appreciate you. Zuby, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it.